This Week in Startups is brought to you by Dollar Shave Club. See why over 3 million members love Dollar Shave Club. Get your first month of the club for free. Just pay shipping. DollarShaveClub.com slash twist. And AdRoll, the most widely used retargeting platform in the world with over 25,000 advertisers. Get started with a $100 credit at AdRoll.com slash twist. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups. I'm back in my second hometown, which is Los Angeles, as you guys know. I grew up in Brooklyn for 20 years, spent 10 years in Manhattan, and then I had the delightful 10-year vacation in my 30s and got lost in Los Angeles, an amazing place to live, second only in my mind to New York City. And now I live in San Francisco, which is a mess of a city. My God, the poorest run city I've ever seen in my life, especially one that's absolutely crushing it in terms of innovation uh, and in terms of being the center of the universe. But I'm back here in LA and I decided I would do like a little quick tour, meet a couple of, uh, meet up with a couple of my old friends and do some interviews. Now, one of my oldest friends in the ecosystem here is a guy named Mark Suster. He does a blog called Both Sides of the Table. Why is it called Both Sides of the Table? Well, because he spent 10 years of his life running car startups and 10 years now investing, or almost 10 years. He's gonna have his 10 year anniversary as a partner at what was GRP Ventures and is now Upfront Ventures. Upfront Ventures, yeah. yes. Uh, and so you made that big change a couple of years ago, uh, and um, just delighted to ha have you back on the program. You were last time you were on the program, yeah. like Tyler was running it, and That's I was true. probably five or six years ago, and you were in your first year as a venture capitalist. Well, it was great having you in LA. So we miss having you here. It was well, great you. to have both uh, your friendship and also to have media covering the tech sector yeah. from Los Angeles because. I find the tech sector coverage ends up being so San Francisco biased that sometimes yeah. the views and perspective of what's talked about don't represent the whole country. It is kind of amazing when you think about how well the Los Angeles ecosystem has done, uh, and you've got your fingerprints on some of it. Um, in recently, Snapchat and Maker, uh, and you were an early investor at Maker, yeah. you invested in the A round? Seed round. Seed round. We were the first institutional money in the company and wow. the largest shareholder. So you put 500K or something in that 750K. range? 750K. 750K, it's worth what, five, 10 million at that time? Somewhere in that zone? Uh, less. Less? Mm -hmm. Three, four, five million maybe, wow. Uh, back then valuations were a little bit lower. Yeah, as you'll remember from your Uber round. Absolutely, uh, we'll get to that. <laughs> the one I didn't do. <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> we, we took us about 60 seconds to get there. Uh, it is interesting, the pain of missing. Yes. But let's talk about some hits while we're at it. Maker, you believed that YouTube's ecosystem would create a company, but you believed this at a time when YouTube, I don't even think was selling ads, uh, or maybe had just started. They had just started. Just started. It was like yeah. year one of YouTube sharing revenue with consumers. Yeah. What was it you saw in Maker, which if memory serves me correct, was a little, um, I don't wanna use the word unprofessionally run, but a little loosey-goosey perhaps at the start. Um, it was a loosey-goosey startup in a very speculative area. Why did you guys choose to write the 750K check? Well, let me start by giving uh, a charitable definition to what the management team was. Uh, it was started by a group of makers, a group of people who created video themselves and they saw themselves as like United Artists. United Artists was started by people from the industry saying, we want to create a studio kind of for us, by us, right? Yeah. Um, and that's what Maker Studios was. It was a group of people who hadn't broken into Hollywood, who realized that the system wasn't set up for them. And they found that they could build this community of people through YouTube where they could produce content, be actors, writers, comedian, uh, guitar players, you name it. <clears throat> and that opportunity was open to them the way Hollywood wasn't open. So let me be clear about one thing. I never believed in building a YouTube company. And to this day, I still don't believe. Really? Yeah. So you invested in a company predicated on being a, operating in the YouTube ecosystem, or were they not? Was that I, just a, a misreading of the situation? They just happened to you know, stake their claim there. Listen, um, you need to fish in the pond where all the fish are, right? right. Like, there was one massive lake and it was called YouTube and right. that's where all the fish were. So to not be there was a mistake. But the most misunderstood thing I think about YouTube, for me, it's only the top end of your funnel. Mm. And I like to think of it as a funnel. <clears throat> think about this, you build a company, 
And often on the web, your goal is to do SEO, sometimes to do SEM if it's a paid product to drive traffic. If you do SEM or you buy social, you buy a Facebook ad, you buy a Twitter ad, you're paying people to drive traffic to your website to try and convert them, whether it's for SaaS purposes or e-commerce to sell a product. YouTube is the one place that pays you to develop content. The problem is, is if you view YouTube as your business, your margins at best are about 17 and a half percent. But on the other hand, if you view it as a top end of the funnel, the pace, place where I build a brand mm. to drive traffic somewhere else to do something else, right. that can be insanely valuable. One example for you, Jason, is Loot Crate. Do you know Loot Crate? No. So Loot Crate is on the crate? front. Crate? Crate. Okay. Loot. Like as in a box. Yeah. Got it. Loot Crate. Loot. L-O-O-T. Oh, Loot Crate. Yeah. Yeah, Loot Crate. They're on the front cover of Inc. Magazine, mm. this edition. The reason they're on the front cover is it's the fastest growing company in America. Wow. Yeah. And they got from zero to a hundred million in sales with no venture capital. This is the capital. subscription boxes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Got it. So how does this relate? You get a box of stuff every month. You pay because 20 bucks a month, 30 bucks a month. People like Loot Crate, people like Ipsy, people like FabFitFun mm. have built very large passionate audiences in YouTube. Mm and have found ways to then migrate audiences- Off to, of YouTube. Off of YouTube ah. <clears throat> to spend money. So whether that's physical product like Loot Crate, fastest growing company in America, whether that's digital, we have a company called Seriously. They have a product called Best Fiends, like mm. best, best Friends Without the R. Mm. It's a mobile game company. They have overwhelming amount of customer acquisition through YouTube. They develop funny, entertaining content on YouTube. They drive people to their website to download mm. their product and start using it. Now, the interesting thing is you don't pay YouTube for those videos. You have to pay the cost of production, but if you develop compelling content, you can actually get paid. Right, so even though YouTube's taking 45% of the revenue and only giving 55, which makes it impossible really to build a business on YouTube. If you can look at that as monetized marketing, as I like to call it, a way to sort of get marketing and maybe make a little bit of money or defer the cost of it, you can then funnel it off there. You may know this, but yep. the example that I tried to give five or six years ago, if you wanna sell candy bars, hmm. you have a choice. Do you wanna sell in Walmart, yes or no? If you sell in Walmart, you're not gonna make a lot of margin as a new startup candy bar provider. Yeah, Walmart's gonna make sure of that. Yeah, because they have power. They're 800 pound gorilla in terms of distribution. But what you have the ability to do is build a brand, get people to be passionate about your product. And can I then drive fulfillment mm. to my specialty version of my candy bar in my own shop or in, in other retailers? And I view YouTube the same way. Right. Um, now that business grew to um, tens of millions of dollars in revenue. And then eventually Disney bought it. Mm -hmm for 500 million and a $500 million earn out or something in that range? 450 earn out. Okay, so a billion dollars essentially, uh, potentially. Mm -hmm. um, how was it done since it got bought? Uh, what, what is the candid, you know, sort of um, assessment of Disney's purchase and has it, are you still involved or no? I was involved until recently. Yeah. The earn out is done. Oh, great. Uh, so I don't have any legal oversight of the asset yeah. or involvement with it. Um, I think Disney's happy with it. I think it's suiting Disney's need as a way to develop online audiences for other products and other purposes. Um, as an outsider, it's not yeah. like what I would like to see Maker mm -hmm. have become, but I knew that when we sold it because yeah. Disney has other motives of what to do with their online channel. Uh, so you guys did phenomenal, over 100x return. We did very 200x well. 200x and we something did in that well. range. So that's phenomenal uh, to return. That returns the whole fund. Is that like what they call a dragon? Stuart Alsop, did it return the entire fund? It didn't return the whole fund. But close. It returned a lot of the fund, but it didn't return the whole fund because I did the investment with another co-investor. Ah, so we it. didn't have, like normally we try to own 20, 25% and we mm. didn't own the same got it. level because we had a co-investor. Right, so you made that sacrifice. Why, why are VC so obsessed with um, hitting that 20% mark? We hear that a lot. Um, and you used to be an entrepreneur and you probably heard that and thought, well, that's not in my best interest. I would rather have two world-class VCs on my board than one. What's the thinking on that? How, how do you reconcile that? Well, I would From being on both sides of the table. 
So I'll use that yeah. to tell entrepreneurs, if you go to my blog and you scroll through the last month, so where are we now? It's September, 2016, sometime in July or August of 2016, if people watch this later, um, I have a presentation uh, where I, I call the blog post Focus on Basecamp. Mm -hmm. It's my analogy for startup entrepreneurs. Basecamp as in like uh, getting to um, on Everest, Mm -hmm. the, uh, the level at the base of the mountain. Exactly. Got it. Okay. My metaphor is too many entrepreneurs when they start it are too influenced by VC speak, mm. which is I need to know it can be a unicorn or a decacorn. It needs right. to be worth a billion dollars. I need lots of white space. It needs to be a big untapped market that no one else is focused on. And those are mythical. Like there is no white space because if it was obvious, other people would be doing it. Sure. So the reason I use that metaphor is when you get to Basecamp, if you raise a small amount of money from angels or seed investors, and at Basecamp, you can plot your, your climb. And you may start up part of the mountain and part way up, you're like, okay, now I see it. Mm. Now you go raise five or $10 million to, to climb the mountain. Sometimes you find you're at a false peak and there's nowhere to go. Yeah. And if you've only raised one, two, $3 million, you have a lot more alternatives with your business than if you've taken venture capital. So I had been talking about Basecamp. And in that presentation, I talked about venture economics and why VCs are obsessed with ownership. So what I basically did is say, let's say I give you $2 million at an eight pre, mm -hmm. 10 post. That means I own 20% of your company. Sure. And let's say you sell for $80 million. I mean, that's astounding success by most people, right? You yep. probably made 20, $30 million yourself, right? So I made 16. So I made $16 million and I invested two. That's an 8X, right? That sounds phenomenal, right? Sure. 8X, anyone should be- Life-changing money. money. Yeah. On the other hand, if I have a $250 million fund, I've returned almost none of the fund. Right. And it's by the minimus. way, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't move the needle and for fund economics. And you get 20% or 30%, depending on the fund, of the increase in value. And the increase yes. in value in this example would be 14 million. So the partners at the fund would get, in all likelihood, 20% of 14 million. But or only three after million. we've returned the, the entire, entire fund. fund. So, so if, here's the problem, yeah. Jason, is that if you want to see your way to returning 250 million, it's pretty hard. But don't forget the expectations that LPs place on us is four times return. So we have to get a cash billion dollars, a billion dollars return yeah. on 250 million raise. That's four X gross. And in order to do four X gross, you've got to return a billion dollars on an $80 million exit, which is a great outcome by most people's definition, when I own 20%, I still only return 16 million. Yeah, and so right? if you owned half that amount, that's 1.6% of eight. the expectation, like yeah. that's a drop in the ocean. Now let's then say it's an $800 million exit, like mm -hmm. that's, you know, like Huge. a maker type of Yeah, now it's outcome. a unicorn. So, I mean, that's phenomenal. And let's say that I could have held on to my 20% stake, which more often than not, you end up at 13, 14, 15% if you start with 20. You know, so what am I talking, 160 million? I still haven't returned my fund. Right. I'm 16% of the total fund. And I had an $800 million exit. Right. So 16% uh, of the expectations of me. So the only way that VCs really hit the targets that they need is they need a $3 billion exit, a $4 billion exit, a $5 billion exit. And that'll return two turns of the fund, a two X your yeah. fund. And those kind of returns are what's expected of us if you wanna keep raising venture funds. That's why people are obsessed with ownership. Okay, when we get back from this very important partner message, I wanna ask you about the very controversial uh, Andreessen Horowitz Wall Street Journal story that came out. You have some strong feelings on it. Um, and if they are living up to the hype, and if it was a fair story by the Wall Street Journal um, and how that story wound up getting done, because I thought that all of these LP returns were supposed to be confidential when we get back on This Week in Startups. Hey, everybody. I'd like to welcome a new partner to This Week in Startups. Our family continues to grow as our ratings and the viewership program continues to grow, all these great guests. And uh, our latest partner is Dollar Shave Club. I love this product. I have been shaving every day with the executive blade. I love it. I've never gotten such a clean shave. Uh, I've been using this Dr. Carver shave butter that they do. It's the smoothest I've ever had. It's like this really thick, buttery. You rub it into your beard. And then this executive blade 
I have to say, like, I had to, I've had to adjust my shaving because my old blades, I had to like really dig in there. Now I just glide it right down with that executive blade and love it. Um, you can go to Dollar Shave Club right now, pick a razor from the lineup of amazing blades, and you never have to deal with the drugstore hassle uh, or get these locked up razor fortresses ever again. You can just very easily get them delivered right to your door. And it's really cool. The packaging is very tiny. It's very discreet. You have this nice little bag. You open it up. And it, I don't feel like it's wasting any uh, environmental problems or anything. It's just very efficient. And never having to go to the store again or think about my shaving again. And just having that daily routine taken care of. And I'm throwing the blades away. And I'm using fresh blades on a very consistent basis. I've locked in to Dollar Shave Club. It is the answer uh, if you want to get a great price and have quality. You're not going to make a decision over quality or price. You're going to get incredible quality at an incredible price. I absolutely love it. So here's your call to action. This is what you got to do if you're a super fan or if you shave. <laughs> Dollar Shave Club is so confident in the quality of all their products that they're going to give you the first month free. That's right. Just pay the shipping. After that, it's just a few bucks a month. No long-term commitment, no hidden fees. Get the first month free. DollarShaveClub.com slash twist, T-W-I-S-T. DollarShaveClub.com slash twist. DollarShaveClub.com slash twist. I absolutely, sincerely love the product and been using it every day. You will look, smell, and shave like a million bucks without paying for it. Literally, you know, I don't need to read commercials for a living. I've done okay as an angel investor. I would not steer you wrong. I genuinely have gotten the best shave of my life with their executive blade. It is amazing. Go ahead and go to DollarShaveClub.com slash twist and... Get the best shave of your life at a really fair price. And just think of the cognitive overload. You never have to think about shaving again. I love it. All right, let's get back to this amazing episode. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. You can find me on the Twitter at Jason. And you can find the show in iTunes and all the other popular podcasting apps. Here's a request and a favor People come up to me all the time. Somebody just stopped me and Phil's coffee. Hey, love the show. Love this guest. Thank you so much for putting out all this great content. Um, hey, listen, there's a price to pay. If you really want to help me, go in and write a really great review in the iTunes store. It super helps in terms of the rankings and people getting to know the show. So go ahead and write a review in the iTunes store. Unless, of course, you hate the show. I don't know why you would have gotten to this minute 15 in the show. If you hate the show, then just email jason at launch.co and tell me, why it sucks, and I'll try to do a better job for you, 675 episodes in. Um, listen, there was a big uh, kerfluffle last uh, week or the week before when the Wall Street Journal wrote a story about Andreessen Horowitz, which, whatever, five, six years ago when Andreessen Horowitz came on the scene, uh, they basically rattled the entire venture industry by deciding to hire only millionaires as partners and then take all their funds and hire a giant team of service providers, marketers, recruiters, et cetera, business development people, to basically tell everybody, we're the best venture firm in the world, we are the ones you should uh, do business with. And on top of that, they raised incredibly large funds and started writing very big checks at very high valuations. The criticism, of course, has been, um, hey, maybe they paid too much for some of these startups, and there's been a long list of companies, I don't know, long list, but there's been a list of companies like Quirky, Zenefits, whatever, people who they paid high prices for that have had problems, uh, which I'm not sure if that's fair or not fair. But anyway, the returns are how we're all judged in this business at the end of the day. And the Wall Street Journal seemed to state, I think the basic premise of the piece was, they've only returned a billion dollars on a billion dollars, which to me, still a billion dollars but that the reputation of Andreessen Horowitz is that they're a top tier fund and they're simply not anywhere near Benchmark, Sequoia, and other firms, uh, Founders Fund, who are their contemporaries. You came to their defense. What did you think of the story and what's the defense of the firm and what are your just candid thoughts on Andreessen Horowitz as a venture firm? Well, first of all, I thought it was an interesting story. It was a Rolf Winkler who yeah, he's is good. a thoughtful journalist. He gets good information too. And it was uh, well researched. Yeah, um, he always seems to get confidential information pretty good. Yeah, he got the Sequoia Scouts information dialed in too. It's not that hard if you're a good investigative reporter. Is it? I mean, getting somebody who has the LP returns to give up those documents. I mean, isn't there's, the an, there's enough sources of people who could. I mean, they they I legally guess. probably shouldn't be. Well, legally they're not allowed to. <clears throat> For yeah. sure, they have a confidentiality in their agreement. 
but you would also not get invited to the next fund. So if it is leaked, who offline, leak I'll tell you 10 sources of how you can get it. I oh, just okay. don't want to discuss it uh, oh, yeah. on camera, but Got there it. are ways to get it. Mm. Um, but let me say this. I thought it was generally speaking a fair piece. Got it. And Andreessen Horowitz certainly doesn't need my defense. They're smart enough and <clears throat> they have a team of people who can write their own defense. I weighed in because I thought while it was smart and researched, I thought it slightly missed the mark. I thought its uh, core premise was slightly off and here's why. What matters about a venture fund first and foremost is whom do entrepreneurs want to raise capital from? Got it. And I seldom meet entrepreneurs who wouldn't die to work with Andreessen Horowitz. And that's just fact. Now, yeah, they have a great brand. They have a ben great brand. Ben has done great work. Mark has done great work. Chris Dixon has done great work. They've got good, smart people. And on top of that, because they've invested in these services, entrepreneurs recognize they're getting a benefit from that. Do so, they? Do entrepreneurs I'm want gonna, those services? Let, let me come to that in a yeah, moment. Okay. But I want to say first off, I rarely meet entrepreneurs who wouldn't want to work with Andreessen Horowitz. Neither now, at the margin, people may choose Benchmark. Maybe you want to work with Bill Gurley. Sure. People may choose Sequoia. They're the best VC of the last 30 years. Yep. <clears throat> they may choose to work with Josh Elman at Greylock, who's a great product guy. Yep. Um, so there's a lot of choice out there, but Andreessen's always in the top consideration set. Yeah, top so let's five. say that, number one. To 10. Number two, I happen to know a lot of their LPs. Hmm. I've never heard an LP complaining about Andreessen Horowitz. They seem pretty happy with the deals they're getting into and the returns so far. Number three, um, the hardest thing about private valuations is this notion that you know of called mark to market. Define it for the audience. So the way it works is we invest in companies. Let's say I put in $5 million. Sure. From day one, when I write the check, I have one X investment. It hasn't increased in value. Use the maker example as an example to walk us through this. So we wrote a check, 750K. It was at a four and a half million dollar valuation. The next money that came in, I think came in at like a $21 million valuation. Okay. So you're so 5X. We're 5X on that first investment. Now we write a second check at $21 million. So then we have a blended ownership level, right? Some of it is at 5X. The new money we write is at 1X, right? Just like the public share was at ten, was at $5 and now is at $21. Exactly the same. You can keep same. buying shares as it goes up. Exactly the same. And the only difference between public and private is public, the price is adjusted, not just every day, but on a millisecond basis yeah. of a day. Uh, through the trading hours of 9.30 to 4.30 uh, Eastern time. Now, the difference for us is those prices don't adjust constantly. So how do you know when to adjust the price? Well, we typically will adjust it when someone else invests because that's an outsider setting the value of your company. Got it. When the companies become larger, sometimes you'll do what's called public comps. So you'll find comparables and you'll say, how are those companies valued? So if I have a company doing 250 million in sales, and let's say it's an e-commerce company, I'll say, well, how much are the public e-commerce trading for in terms of a multiple of revenue or gross margin sure. or growth? So if Amazon is public or you know um, buy.com is public, you can say, hey, here's what Zappos before it was bought by Amazon might be worth. And then we take a private market discount. Ah. So we actually apply a discount to it. But that's to what, be conservative. Yeah. And that's and and there's also generally a, a discount for illiquidity. Mm. So um, you can't sell the shares to somebody. Right. And so what we do is for the most part, the mark is your last round of finance. Sometimes when it's bigger, you'll look at public comps, but it's an imperfect science. And so my example is WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. WhatsApp sold for $19 billion, right? Approximately. Yeah, I was in that fund. And uh, the day before a term sheet arrived, they were probably valuing it at a billion or a billion and a half dollars sure. because it didn't have a huge amount of revenue that they could do a mark to market. They wouldn't have had a reason to increase the valuation. So you can see that someone's fund can dramatically change in one stroke. For sure. So my point is Andreessen Horowitz in their portfolio might be sitting on three WhatsApps. Right. Well, or they might be sitting on three more quirkies. Right. It's unknowable to an outside journalist to know. I mean, sometimes it's unknowable to you as a partnership. 
it would be in a way unknowable because the price that uh, a large company is willing to pay is very hard to determine. Jet.com sold for $3 billion. It could have just as easily gone bankrupt. And I'm not saying it's on the verge of bankruptcy, but it wasn't guaranteed to even return 1X. If they had run out of money and no one was willing to continue financing that business, right. it would have gone to zero. So there's such binary outcomes. And that's all I was trying to point out. Entrepreneurs, so you asked me a question about services. Yeah, let's okay? talk about that. Because I mean, just to recap, the piece seemed fair and accurately reported. Great. Um, Entrepreneurs love the firm. I can confirm that. Like, mm -hmm. who wouldn't want to have Ben Horowitz, you know, or Mark Andreessen or Chris Dixon? These are smart cats. Um, LPs, I can't confirm, but you can that they like the firm. And yeah. I would think, even for an LP, getting back two times your cash, even if their goal is four times, two times is better than losing money. And when you invest as an LP, of course, you care about current returns because that's the fund you're in. But you also care about, like, are these guys getting into the best deals? Because what happens as an LP is you put your money into a blind pool. And what that means is I have no, I'm giving you money. I have no idea what you're going to invest in mm. and I have no say in it. Right. So I'm handing you money and I'm in effectively investing in the future. So what I have to believe is that you have good judgment. You have partners who are hardworking and committed. And I have to believe that you're going to get into better deals than other people because people want to work with you. So you're betting on the future. Right. And most LPs are not doing one fund and then waiting and seeing. They're going to invest in multiple funds. If you commit to a fund, the, the yeah. saying is that you typically are committing to three funds. Mm -hmm. Got it. You want to keep going with that fund manager because their WhatsApp, their Uber, you know, their Google, it could be so in fund two and five. Here's my example. One and four. Here's my example. Excel right. has long been considered amongst the top firms in Silicon Valley. They hit a rough patch post.com bust around 2002, three and four. So they were raising a fund, I think in 04 approximately. Yeah, not and a great time. A number of their LPs pulled out because they thought Excel had lost their way. Oops. That's the fund that got into Facebook. Yeah, they did the Series A. And it's amongst the best funds in history of all time. What was the Series time. B? Series A. What was the Series A? Series A. Yeah. They wanted the about B, 10%. The B was Greylock. Yep. And people thought they were crazy. I think they paid $450 million or yeah, something was, like that. Well, I mean. People thought was, they were crazy. There was a big question mark at that time if Facebook could ever have an advertising market because the ads and social networks performed so poorly. I think what people underestimated was even if the ads do perform poorly compared to Google search, which they do, they're a magnitude less effective on a click-through basis but they're a magnitude more effective because it's so big. The pie is so big. And you know, this targeting of individuals and understanding their behavior is so so. The most huge. interesting thing about Facebook to me yeah. is the transition from web to mobile. Mm. Because I had several mobile investments before Facebook had properly made the shift that were doing tons of revenue, ad tech type revenue of yeah. mobile. And in one year, every ad tech company got screwed because Facebook, when it really leaned into mobile marketing, yep. their uh, performance of their ads performed so incredibly well that people moved their entire budget to Facebook. Amazing. Because they know who you are, so their ability to target you with an offer was so precise. So what people always say about Facebook, uh, about Google, is intent-based marketing, sure. right? You so typed in Volvo, I think you want a Volvo. So, and, and that uh, is called intent. Right. I'm showing an intent. If I type in baby stroller, I can infer that you're interested in intent-based marketing. And that's why Google was a better performer than anything that had come before it in history. On Facebook, I now know that you're white and male and affluent and live in San Francisco, have these political beliefs, have these interests, read these articles, click on these have articles, these friends share these, who have, have these, these friends, right? Profiles, right. And so their ability with precision to yep. put things in front of you. So people were critiquing whether or not that was as powerful as intent. Yeah, it turns out it's as or more. As or more. Well, it's as for sure, but, but the pie is so huge. And the, the amount of time spent on Facebook is the other thing. So even if the effectiveness is a fraction of a search ad, where you've typed in the keyword, the fact that you're on search for two minutes a day or three minutes a day and you're on Facebook for 20, 30 minutes or an hour or two, who knows? Here's amongst the interesting things people don't talk about, which is 
with a desktop computer, you have a ton of real estate mm. and real estate means choice, choice for the user of where they click and where they're yep. gonna go. Reducing the real estate massively increases the value of the real estate. Yeah. So I saw e-commerce companies that were converting at a significantly higher rate because they were putting fewer choices in front of the consumers who were converting at higher rates. So you think about Facebook, I control the uh, size because it's mobile and I'm scrolling and I get your attention because it's not being pulled five different ways. All right, when we get back from this final break, we're gonna get into some real stuff. Some real stuff like what does it take to raise a series A in 2016 going into 2017? What mistakes you've made as a venture capitalist, things you change, what you learned in these nine years, you're gonna be 10 years of venture capitalist. Crazy. We're gonna reflect on that. And then also, after we explain to people what it takes to get a series A in your mind, um, how do you deal with sideways companies? Got so many companies, they don't die. They do just good enough. We call them zombie startups in the business. I want to know how you actually deal with those exhausted management teams running those zombie startups that can't get an exit, but they can't seem to die when we get back on This Week in Startups. Hey everybody, I want to take a moment to tell you about retargeting. This is a very, very important thing for startups to understand because customer acquisition is what it's all about and AdRoll is the best retargeting platform on the planet. Over 25,000 advertisers use it. And I want to tell you today about a new product they have. It's called Send Roll. No, it's not sending to get your rolls and buttered rolls. No. This is about email, and SendRoll uh, lets you get all those people who are window shoppers, people who are checking out your website, and then you can convert them into buyers, which is what you want, getting them to sign up for your product or service by email. So imagine they visit your site, but then they get an email follow-up. SendRoll is powerful retargeting tech plus effective emails, and the results have been spectacular. The average SendRoll gets a 45 to 60% open rate and a 10 to 20% click-through. And I can tell you, running inside.com, that that is probably three times, four times the industry average. And it's so easy to set up a send roll campaign. It just takes minutes. They give you all the templates and they have a 24 hour, uh, seven day a week customer service line if you need help. And what I always like to do when we have somebody who has a product uh, that's loved on our program, we don't want to read any sponsor messages, any partner messages for things that are not loved. The great part is a lot of my founders from my portfolio use AdRoll, so it's very easy for me to talk about their new product, SendRoll. James Heller, the founder of Rapify, which went through my incubator, says AdRoll is an integral part of our customer acquisition strategy. It allows us to continue to garner impressions long after the initial customer interaction. It's also one of the most cost-effective tools to bolster any integrated marketing strategy. AdRoll is the best retargeting platform, period. That's according to James Heller, good friend of mine and one of my investments at Rapify. So here's your call to action, everybody. Try SendRoll and get a $100 credit. Just go to adroll.com slash twist, adroll.com slash twist, adroll.com slash twist, and get that $100 credit. And please try that SendRoll and give them some feedback uh, and let them know that at Jason sent you. Okay, let's get back to this amazing program. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. We host this program twice a week. You can go visit the archive at thisweekinstartups.com, and you can find us on all the popular uh, podcasting applications. And if you want to email a suggestion for a guest, somebody you want to hear from, go ahead and email Jackie at launch.co. She is my Emmy Award-winning executive producer. Coming up, uh, on November 14th and 15th is the launch scale event. This is the fourth time we're doing it. 50 plus speakers talking about two topics and two topics only. One, how do you grow your company? Two, how do you raise money? Two tracks, 50 plus talks. And the reason why our events are so amazing and uh, they weren't always as amazing as they are now is because we require every speaker to do a rehearsal two weeks out. I can tell you, magically five or six speakers, about 10% drop out two weeks before we have the event every time because we require them to do a rehearsal. It's a, it's a really great forcing function to see who's actually gonna, gonna bring it. And then we rate them and we tell them candidly, this is what we think. And then we rate them after. We ask you, the guests, to rate how the speakers did. So go to launchscale.net, buy a ticket or get one for free if you're a founder. Uh, we do all of our events just at a break even. We just try to cover our costs and, and provide great content to the ecosystem. Okay, when we left, I wanted to ask you about a number of questions related to what you've learned because now you're a seasoned vet. You came into this, you launched the blog, both sides of the table, nobody knows who you are, 
but you took that blogging and you wrote it to notability while you were building your brand. But now let's face it, now people talk about like, hey, who are the top venture capitalists? Your name comes up on a list with Andreessen Horowitz and Fred Wilson and people who've been in it much longer than you. Yep. What impact has the blog had on your profile, do you think? Uh, I think it's pretty profound and people, uh, <clears throat> I think sometimes struggle to understand the why and the impact. The hardest thing in this business is a battle for share of mind. Okay. How do you get on people's consciousness? How do you influence how they think? How do you make sure they understand how you think? How do you let people know what you're interested in? And you know this intuitively because you do a lot of public stuff. But I started writing, as you know, about YouTube. And then yeah. suddenly anyone in the ecosystem wanted to talk to me about their companies. We started writing about agriculture technology, ag tech. And then suddenly we started getting business plans in ag tech. Not ad tech, A-D, but ag tech, A-G. Okay. A-G. And amongst our hottest companies now in our entire portfolio is an ag tech company. Hmm. And you're going to hear a what lot more about it. Can you say the name? It's, yeah, I can. It's called Appeal. A-P-E-E-L. Let okay. me tell you what they do. They're in the banana business, apparently. Let me <laughs> let me tell you hey what <laughs> let me tell you what Appeal does. <clears throat> it's appealsciences.com if you want to look it up. They take uh, organic compounds from the stems of plants. Okay. And they mix it with different organic compounds and they coat the exterior of plants. And it has two different benefits to it. Number okay. one is it keeps the moisture inside the plant. They make plant lotion? Mm. It's, a, it's a coating. Okay. It's a coating. And number two is it fools bacteria into thinking the fruit is actually a stem. And so bacteria doesn't attack a stem, so it doesn't attack the plant. And so we get about three, three extra weeks yield on something like 13 different crop types. Wow. And let me tell That's you why mind it's, blowing. let me tell you why it's so profound. Okay. So I don't know what I'm allowed to say publicly or not. I have to be careful, right. but let's say a very large foundation based out of Seattle with a big founder of one of the largest software companies sure. in the world Fill in the blanks. has given them money on a foundation basis. Uh, as has a very prestigious uh, New York-based family, to take this to Africa. Why is it important? Because in the United States and South America and Europe, we have something called a cold chain. And a cold chain means I can cut the crop, I can put it in a frozen truck, I can transport it to a distribution center. A frozen distribution center. Frozen yeah. distribution center, deliver it to a retailer, and it starts thawing. And that's when the clock starts ticking on bacteria and other the early signs of um, of rotting, which takes yeah. time. Yeah. Now, Shelf life. if you are in Africa, there's no cold chain. No, no so electricity, no stable electricity. They don't have the ability to export any of their crops. Oh my goodness. Because by the time you would get it anywhere, it's spoiled. And so by coating crops in Africa, we think we can massively increase the GDP of many African nations. Wow. And GDP is everything. My God, if you if you have high GDP, you can tax, you can collect taxes, and then do you things like schools, electricity, the lives infrastructure of people. Yeah, and it's a it's real a scientific time. breakthrough. It's a wonderful company, and you know we just started talking publicly about ag tech and our interest in ag tech, and it helps. So what the blog does is help with share of mind. You know, I'll regularly get an executive from a top tier Silicon Valley uh, tech company or a media company here in LA sending me a thank you note saying, I read your article, it really made me think, really appreciate you writing this. How else do you get on the consciousness of all these people? It's really hard to do. But I wanna tell you something interesting, Jason, is that nine, 10 years ago, people would say nine years ago, people yeah. would come in and they'd pitch and we'd be at a partner meeting and they'd say, Mark, I read your blog, it's so interesting, yep. so I think. But there's so many blogs now. Yeah. And every VC's on Twitter, everyone does media. Every founder, everyone's every co-founder, everybody on the management team. I mean, there's a business, medium.com, which I'm an investor in, predicated on the concept that everybody becomes a blogger and an influencer. So listen, so now when people come to pitch, I promise you, they don't say that. They say, Mark, we watch you on Snapchat. Ah, I must have, I don't know, cause they don't tell you your follower account. I must have 70, 80, 90,000 people follow me on Snapchat. Now. You're kidding. Yeah. And so you get thousands of people who view each video. 
More than 10,000 per video. You're kidding. Yeah. Oh my God, I gotta get on this. No, I'm not kidding. Because so, I was using it like six months ago. But let me tell you how I was getting like a thousand. I wasn't me, really focused on it. Oh, what yeah. is this sequel? What should I do on that Snapchat? How does, how does Snapchat work? I watch what's his name. Who's let the me guy tell from you, YC? Justin does it. Let me tell you what I do. Yeah. Okay, I do something called the Snapstorm. Okay. I take a topic, whether right. it's how do you hire a head of marketing? Uh, how do you raise capital? Uh, how do you fire somebody? Mm -hmm. How do you hire somebody? Um, how do you think about retail distribution? Um, if you're young, how should you build your career? These are all the topics I write about, right? Sure. Now, what's interesting about Snapchat is, you know, it's 10 seconds per video. That constraint turns out to be really powerful because it forces you of course. to be concise. Now, here's the interesting thing. You have to be well thought out. You can't just get on there and be like, oh, I'm going to talk about firing people. It's just like, Duh, you're done. Exactly. So do you, you have to write like bullet points on a piece of paper. I don't. You don't. I don't. You just say to yourself, okay, I'm going to make this point concisely. And then you hit record. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, it's, just so like, it's like in between each take, you have to be crisp. What I do is I may list the five or six macro points I want to cover. Sure. And I just kind of, I take probably 30 seconds, maybe a minute and a half. And I say, these are the points I want to cover. And then just boom, I start recording. And it's like you with the show, it becomes secondhand, right? Yeah. And so here's what's really interesting. <clears throat> Think about a tweet storm. I put out point one, point two, point three, and by the time you're consuming, fifteen other people have written tweets. Oh God, they, so yes, it I gets have. This broken is crazy, up. Yeah. But Snapchat stories, the atomic unit never gets broken. So if yeah. you start watching the top end of my funnel of how to hire a marketing professional, yep. unless you get bored, there's no way for anyone else to get in between us. Yeah. So if at the top end of my funnel I get twelve or thirteen thousand maybe 5,000 will complete. But 5,000 people completing in less than 24 hours is powerful. Now, here's what I do. I then download it and I upload it to snapstorms.com. I now what have a website. What is Snapstorms? Wow. Snapstorms.com, you should go to oh, it. Oh, okay. And I have it by topic. So if you want to huh. look on funding or entrepreneurship Oh my or God, marketing, so genius. Now, how do you do this? Tech oh, you download each video. I download the video. I upload uh, it to VidMe, which is uh, a portfolio yes. company. Yes, VidMe is very cool. I upload it to VidMe. So that's where it's housed. Mm. And then I just provide it in a frame on this website. Uh, so genius. So... Now, yeah. if I tweet one of those out, it'll get 15,000 views. Holy sugar. Yeah. So I get 12,000 to 15,000 original run. I can get 15, 20, 25,000 on a follow-up run on Snapstorms. Incredible. Now, um, I get busy. So sometimes I upload them on Snapstorm and I never reshare it again. Uh -huh. But still thousands of people will find it there. Amazing. Now, what happens as a VC when you become, let's call it industry famous or notable, are you able to do your job anymore because the number of people pitching you or emailing you has become so large that I would think that sorting through stuff is challenging. How do you manage the deluge or is there not a deluge? Is it still manageable? Well, I like to tell venture capitalists that our job should be to play offense, not defense. Defense is when I sit around waiting for people to introduce me to deals. Offense is when I find my own unique sources where I really trust the great deals are happening. And I go out and I talk to those people. So defense to me is YC Demo Day. Yeah. I mean, I should say any Demo Day. I don't pick yeah. on YC. I, I like YC. But Be careful if you don't say you like YC, you could get banned. Uh, I don't have to worry <laughs> about getting banned because I don't go to their Demo Days. You're right. But um, why do VC? I mean, uh, again, not to pick on YC. I have a good relationship with them. The founders are fantastic. But why do we hear that consistently from VCs? I don't go to demo day. Well, let me talk more generically. I don't yeah. go to any demo days. And right. I never so have. I didn't say YC in the front. But I, I want to. I want to. I, I want to explain day? it. Yeah. yeah. Explain it. So, <clears throat> first of all, any great system, uh, there's let's call it there's somewhere between ten to fifty companies. Those have already been picked through by the time they get on stage. So. Ah. At YC, the best companies are going to see Sequoia. They're going to see Andreessen Horowitz. They're going to see the best firms. Not only that. Before they're on stage. YC has mentors. Their insiders come in and pick them over. Of course. So I end they up with something. They denied that publicly. Then it got confirmed. Yeah, it's been back. They and you end up with something called selection bias. Define selection bias. Selection bias is when you're looking at a data set and the data set, uh, it's not a pure data set, right? Okay. It's because... 
if if there's 50 companies and the eight best are taken out of that cohort, I'm looking at 42 companies of which the eight best are already gone. Got it. So if I said to people walking on the promenade, would you like to take, you know, a um, Star Wars survey? If you answer yes, the people who might be inclined to take a Star Wars survey might be fans already. Well, let me say it this way. If I say, do you like Star Wars? And they say yes. And then I say, I'm going to interview you. And I only interview people who say yes. Now I'm not getting a representative yeah. point of view. Right, exactly. Um, it, it's kind of like uh, presidential surveys when they only call home phone numbers rather than mobile phone numbers. You're getting an older demographic set because younger people tend not to have landlines they tend to have mobile phones so you get yeah. a biased data set we just had a whole conversation about home f home lines do you, you have one i do yes you do mm -hmm. i just went through this whole thing i was like why do i don't we use this? it i don't give it out it's just... like the whole point of it was like just we had this whole discussion of like is it worth 500 dollars a for year for me it's like emergency for 911. it's emergency services yeah. that's the only reason i have but then it. it's connected to your data connection so yeah. then you have to have it anyway to have your it, internet but if it's if it's a data service and then your Comcast goes off, then you don't have your phone. So it's like, how do you get one of those old copper lines? Yeah. I want to get one of those old school copper lines that everything goes down in the world, it yeah. still works. Well, you can pay the fee. I Just gotta figure that fee. out. But but listen, so my thing about demo days is number one, selection bias. Got it. Number two is I'm not seeing what I wanna see. I'm seeing your best self. It's the same reason I don't take deals from investment bankers. I don't need to see your polished pitch deck that someone else told you what to write. You know, probably you know this, Jason, is probably the famous, most famous blog post I ever wrote was called, I invest in lines, not dots. Yes. And a dot, the definition of dot is if you imagine an X and Y axis, X is time and Y is how you performed. And when I meet you, it's high or low, it doesn't matter. Uh, if I see you at demo day, I'm just seeing one data point. But I like to see, how did you get introduced to me? How did you handle it if I didn't return your email? How did you handle the follow-up email after you saw me? How did you handle the fact that your co-founder quit? How did you handle the fact that Facebook tried to block you from their, you know, graph. network, yeah, yeah, from their graph? How did you handle the fact that a big competitor just raised $25 million? Like, I like to see over time, both the things that go well, how many versions of your product did you ship? And I like to see how you handle adversity. And over time, I can establish a pattern and that's what I call a line of how you do. So let's just take a demo day. I would fund a YC company, no problem, but I want Probably not at demo day. Not at demo day. I'd wanna see you before. I'd wanna see how the company was developing. I'd wanna like get to know you leading up to demo day. I might even like to see how you perform the six weeks sure. after demo day, but I'm trying to establish a pattern. So at a demo day, you're seeing the polished best self demo version of each company. And it's not even authentic. It's what someone else told them to say. Yeah, it's been super scripted. Yes. Um, and they have two minutes, which is just not the right amount and of time. And it's not just YC, it's any demo yeah. day. It is interesting. It's when I run my incubator, I do seven companies. And because only because I thought every class, I want to spend meaningful time with all seven. So we literally spend 20 minutes on each company, yeah. each class. So when you think about that, like 18 sessions in 12 weeks, 20 minutes on each class, I can really actually get to know the founders and actually kind of build the line. But the one of the big pieces of advice I give people is say, well, I'm not really ready to raise money right now, whatever. And I say, okay, I understand. Why don't you go meet with the seven investors you respect most or try to get that meeting yep. just to put a dot in the line? And they okay. say, what's the line? And I say, well, it's Mark Suster's line. Like, you want to just at least get on the radar and just say, hey, Jason, or uh, I read this blog post about you that you wrote. Our business is going great. Would love to get some advice for you and just introduce that Jason thought we'd be a match or you thought we'd be a match. By the way, yeah. it's even more important for the entrepreneur than the founder. And here's why, okay? If I get it wrong because I invested because I was frenzied and I wrote a $2 million check and it turns out you're a bad guy or the market's bad or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. I have 35 investments per fund. It's not, you know. You can write it off pretty easily. But if you raise from the wrong investor, there's no divorce clause. No. You may spend the next five years working with this person and you're stuck, right? Right. And so what They're I tell people is differences. more than anything, you care about the line. Did I introduce you to the five people I said I was going to? Was I thoughtful every time I came to uh, see you? Did I remember our last meeting? Did you take did notes? I, did you look at your phone during the... Did I did I look at my phone the entire time? Oh my you God. Know? I literally, like, I had a VC fall asleep in a meeting. 
I had. You know that I ended up on the front cover of Valley Wag when I was an entrepreneur for this exact topic, right? You fell this, asleep? No, 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 no. As a blogger, uh-huh. as an entrepreneur, I right. did what very few people do. I went to a VC meeting. This is 2005 or uh-huh. 2006. And I wrote this scathing uh, article about this firm and how terribly they treated me. Did you me. name the name? I did not. But, Good. but, but they put it together. It got named. Oh. So I did not name it. But the partners turned up late. They spent all their time on their Blackberries. Blackberries were big yeah. back then. And they asked such bullshit questions. They kept saying to me, well, isn't Microsoft just going to do this, which is oh, what you said in 05? And by the way, uh, I already had term sheets. Yeah. I, li- I was living in Palo Alto. I didn't have a lot of money. Such bad behavior. I drove up to San Francisco. I paid $45 for parking. And I'm like, why the F did you bring me here if you weren't really like convicted? Be present. Like, yeah. You know what the, the really um, asinine part of that whole story is? What? It would cost them nothing, even if they didn't, if they decided in the first 30 seconds, this isn't the deal for us. It costs you nothing to be graceful. It costs you nothing to be considerate. It costs you nothing to be present. You could just be present for 45 minutes could and I give five you good a questions. Big lesson learned for entrepreneurs, Jason. Sure. On this topic. I always say, and I'm going to give the negative of this. I always say to VC partners, if you really dislike a business, be gracious. Don't yeah. be a jerk. Because you know you're not going to invest. So why yeah. cost you zero? Cost you zero to be nice. But on the other hand, for entrepreneurs, if you go to a meeting and your goal is just present, 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 get through all your slides and they're not, they're nodding their head. That's a bad meeting. Yeah. Cause they nod their head and don't engage if they're not really interested. Yeah. And so what you really want is engagement and How discussion. A founder get engagement in a meeting as opposed to rifling through the deck, which there is a deck culture. You want to get through a deck. People like a deck. It's the tradition. What, what are some keys to getting feedback from those investors? Raising money uh-huh. is a sale. Okay. It's like a sales meeting. So you need to learn sales. And what I tell people is you start by establishing credibility. Now I controversially, but I'm right, believe that your bio of your top executive should be at the start of your presentation. That is controversial. Most people are like, I don't care. It can be slide three. Most people say it should go at the end, but here's why it matters, Jason. If you sit and you go through 25 slides and let's say, and this happened to me, you're a Caltech engineer and you're presenting and you're presenting and you're presenting and I don't know that. The whole time I was sitting in this meeting wondering, this sounds credible, but I don't know if I believe this person. At the very end, he said, well, I'm a double E from Caltech. And you're like, oh, credibility through the roof. If I had known on slide three, I would have been leaning in more. I would have, because mm. he, he sounded so salesy to me. I just thought he was a sales guy, Interesting. right? But, so I think you establish your bona fides. Bona fides very early. Um, and... What you want to do is you establish credibility, both what is the problem I'm solving? What is my solution? Why am I uniquely positioned to solve this? That's my credentials. So like product market fit. Yeah. And why we can win. And then what you need to do is ask a question Ah. and you say, well, here's something we're grappling with. Ah, the cut is the Kung Fu. Have you seen Mm. this solution? I mean, this is the way we're thinking about it. Does it sound sensible to you? Ah. Here's what people need to know. And you know this because naturally you're a salesperson. I mean, you have that gene, but people like you more if they're talking. Mm. People like to participate. And then people buy into the nuance of what you're doing if they're engaged in a conversation. Now I've got you. And by the way, even if you disagree, now I know what you disagree with and I can kind of work with that. Right. But if you disagree and you don't say anything and I'm just piling through my slides and then we leave and they walk away thinking, ah, I didn't really believe that. Yeah, they never got engaged. How hard is it to raise the Series A right now? We, we heard years ago about the Series A funnel problem, too many deals, too many companies coming out of incubators. Frankly, too many companies hitting, you know, decent revenue, decent user traction, not enough VCs to fund them. How is that all hashed out the Series A sort of log jam. Well, let me say this, Jason, is it depends on your definition of what a series A is. Okay. The first two to $3 million of capital is not that tough to raise on a relative basis. I know it's always hard to raise it's money, hard. but there's a lot of sources for two to $3 million. There's fewer sources for seven to $10 million. Now that used to be A and B. Right. You know, now we A's call it used to be C to two A. or three million. Two or three, million. maybe up to five. Right. Up to five. Now, do you see a $5 million Series A often? 
when people raise $5 million, they're obsessed with calling it a seed round. I have no idea why. I just, I've stopped caring. Is that caring. because people want to push off governance and they want to like have no, no governance? No, they'll raise a seed and have a board seed, but they just think, they th it's like market. Like I want the market to think that's my seed. I don't know why it's stupid. Interesting. It's not worth, it's not worth fighting. I don't fight over it anymore, but it's dumb. It's like, what do you want to call it? Who cares? Who cares? Who cares? But um, so two to $3 million, relatively easy to raise, maybe up to four. The seven to 10 million, it's hard because yeah. you've got to show a lot more proof in your company. Right. The idea of VCs betting on product market fit, um, but not a lot of traction. Are, are those days over? I are don't think so. There I are still some risk taking VCs out there? That's what we do. Yeah. We do it all the time, as you know, because we're yeah. in deals together. Um, <clears throat> here's the thing. Uh, I wrote about this in Q4 of last year and Q1 of this year. When the uh, markets were coming apart. The markets did come apart. Yeah. And the reason was, is between 2012 and 2015, the median valuation of a late stage round went up 300%. It's crazy. Crazy. We're talking about the Series C, the Series D. Yeah. So the reason, Jason, is because... It used to be that only VCs invested in those rounds. For every $1 that a VC raised from LPs, $1 went into a portfolio company. By 2015, for every $1 a VC raised, $2.4 were going into a portfolio company. Where's the other dollar and 40 cents coming from? Uh, LPs doing direct investments. Got it. Hedge funds, mutual funds, family offices, sovereign wealth. People just got really bullish and corporates right but it was everyone from rakuten google uh it was fidelity t -Rose. it was t Rowe, it was the hedge funds now that all slowed down they came down and invested in that late stage because companies weren't going public or they had money to burn or they, what? They felt FOMA? What was the reason? All of the above. Okay. And each individual actor in that supply chain has different motives. For the mutual funds, it was a way to place a marker on companies that were going to IPO. So um, they want to get into Airbnb or Uber or Lyft uh -huh. or Instacart. They just dipped down. Because they couldn't buy enough in the IPO. <clears throat> and the market cap by the time it went IPO was already significant. Which is, is that a good thing that companies are waiting longer to go IPO? Or is it a bad thing? Because we have this really bifurcated philosophy where you have Travis at Uber saying, we're going to take our time. And then you have Bill Gurley saying, get public, get public. You have Zuckerberg who waited forever saying, now I should have gone public earlier. Who's right? Who's wrong? I err more on the side of Bill Gurley. And I, I'll say I err on the side of Mark Schuster because I've been writing publicly about it for a long time. Here's what I actually Go believe. Go public earlier. Not, not, not early or too early, but I think delaying it for too long is a bad thing. Why? Because, look, I understand the negativity of having to worry about hedge funds and people taking short positions and all the negativity, but... So people can short a public stock, they can't do it to a private. Here, here's, yeah. here's my analogy. I take countries, okay? You know, Winston Churchill famously said, democracy is the worst form of government, except for everything else. Right. You know, it's messy, it's hard. If you read anything about... Uh, world history. So like um, Neil Ferguson, Civilization, which is a wonderful book. If you read <clears throat> Jared Diamond, Guns, Germs, and Steel. If you read my favorite book recently is um, The Accidental Superpower, Peter Zahan. All of these books portray some amount of the messiness of country to country conflict is always what created great countries because they were forced to innovate and create new weaponry relative to their competition in order to survive. And that sort of innovation is what led to there being great countries and why China itself didn't innovate because it was so closed off, why Japan didn't innovate because it was so closed off, why the Ottoman Empire ultimately imploded. And I think that level of constant competition forces you to be better. So if you take America, people think America's lost its way. I think the fact that we have 50 experiments across the country where each state can create its own rules. Sure. And you see it working in California, so Nevada tries it or you know, Wisconsin tries it. 
Um, or you see something fail in the state of Indiana and you're like, let's not do that, right? And that level of competition across states makes us a great country. And the fact that our country itself has this makes us a better country, even though it's harder to get stuff done. So it's very simple to look at China and say, God, I wish we could do what China does and just build a road wherever we want. Do whatever we want. Imminent domain. Here we go. But I, I don't think that builds as sustainable of a country long term. Now, I think the same is true about companies is if you stay private, the CEO can kind of do what he or she wants. God King. But I think they probably misallocate resources. I think they can hide stuff that's not going as well. They don't face that constant pressure of scrutiny. You know, the the uh, sunshine, you know, which yeah. I forget what the saying is, but. <clears throat> yeah, it, it heals wounds. So yeah. I think. Cures everything. Having sunshine, I think, forces you to be a better company. And for companies who go public and then can't handle that, it probably wasn't a fantastic company to begin with. Are there too many companies now? Are there too many experiments going on? We've heard about, gosh, companies cost less and less and less to start up, but they're raising more and more and more when they start scaling. Do we have too many experiments going on or is it healthy to have a lot of failed experiments and all these incubators putting out a bunch of different companies? Are we letting people who are not ready to be entrepreneurs you know, start companies and it should be, we should be a little bit tighter about who we give this opportunity to. Well, we don't get to decide because there's markets, right? Sure. And the fact that there's a market wanting to fund way more of these companies speaks to what the opportunity is. On the other hand, I think the vast majority of the money going into these early stage companies is going to be squandered. Okay. So the vast majority of startup companies aren't going to get to the next level. The vast majority of A companies aren't going to get to C or D or have big right. realizations. When does that flip? When do the vast majority actually get a return? When they're at the B or the C level? I, you know, I guess, you know, when this, you start getting to the sure bet, this elusive product market fit, you yeah. know, it's when, you know, I have a company, which I'll tell you about offline that you've looked at in the past that was a rocket ship. And then it hit one year of kind of flat growth. And now the rocket ships even faster. Huh. And when we hit flat growth, investors looked at it and I tried to point out why the economics were so great in the company. And people were saying, eh, now that we're like this, everyone's chasing us. Huh. Because it's almost certain now it's gonna be worth hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billion plus. I mean, it's so predictable now. Um, it's hard for me to define, it's yeah. undefinable, but you know it when you see it, I guess like yeah. porn, right? But when you see something where the economics work, where your growth is unbounded, where the competition can't just immediately enter the market, then the only question is, as a new investor, are there returns left? Because if the company's going like this and they raise at an artificially high valuation, then the question is, is there still upside for the people who invest? So it's hard to know what is the right price to pay, but you know when a company's going to succeed. Let's talk a little bit uh, about the problems you deal with when you hit that decade of investing. You have investments that have not died, but not soared. What do you do? Do, you, do the founders buy the stock back? Do they write it off? How do you deal with a zombie company, a company that's never going to get bought or sold or unlikely to break out or get bought or sold, but it's impossible to die and the founder doesn't want to give up? How do you deal with those founders who don't give up in year seven, eight, nine, ten? Well, let me say that there are some great companies that are still in yet year seven, eight, nine, ten um, that may still be valuable. So let me broaden to say zombie plus. Okay. So the so slow and steady plus zombie. The biggest challenge for VCs is if you're active and you take board seats, you can't keep doing new investments and adding and adding and adding without subtracting anything. It doesn't work. Um, so what VC firms do, we add partners. You may know we've added three partners over the last four years. We add partners. Um, number How do you pick those partners? I, I noticed... Um, a little bit of diversity in the group. You have a female partner? We do have a female partner, okay. Karen Norman. Yeah. Um, I would say to you, here's where I start. Yeah. I start by saying, I would like to have partners who have some level of operating experience. Okay. I think it matters these days. Now, I'm not going to say everyone has to have operating experience. I mean, Fred Wilson, who I put on a pedestal and respect a lot, has been a VC, I think, all his of entire his life, life yeah. right? Um, 
And Mike Moritz, I don't think, had operating experience. He was a journalist and then became a VC. So I'm not going to say it's absolutely a requirement, but I think it's pretty darn useful. For sure. um, To both have the operating experience to provide the wisdom, but also the empathy because Mm. you've been in their shoes before. So I look for that. It's not a requirement. Number two is I like to have investment experience. Did you have some investment experience either setting up your own accelerator or have you been a VC or have you been an angel investor or a seed investor, whatever. Um, What matters as a VC is we really have three constituency and maybe call it four that matter. First and foremost, of course, it's entrepreneurs. So do you have ability to network and find where great entrepreneurs reside? And then when those deals become competitive, will they want to work with you? So that's number one. Number two is what I call upstream capital. I need to know, Jason, that if you fund a deal, there's some deals you may send to 20 people, but there's some that you may say, Mark, you know what? This is for you. And I really want to work with you on this deal. And you or I, you and I are on a board together. And hopefully you would say, my experience with Mark has been good enough yeah. that I'll send him a great deal that I have, right? So you have to earn that respect over time. And it takes a unique individual who can get upstream investors interested in you. The same is true about downstream. You know, I might write a $5 million check. I might have 12 in total that I can invest, but I may have a company that needs 30 or $40 million. So I need to know that the people who can write 30 to $40 million respect me, hmm. right? So upstream investors matter. Downstream investors matter. Entrepreneurs matter. So reputation is huge. It's everything. Yeah. It's everything. And so that matters a lot to me. And I care about... Uh, high ethics and I care about your ability to work well with us as a team. Because the partnership is super deep. You guys are, it's the legal structure is like being married. You have to have each other's best interests at all times. Yes. If you don't, you could wind up in a very bad place. Our economic returns are all dependent upon each other. Yeah. So, you know, it's a hard thing to recruit for, but I feel great. We hired uh, Greg Bettinelli yep. uh, just under four years ago. He's gotten us into some of our best deals. He got us into Loot Crate. Yep. He got us into Ring. Nice. I love my Ring. I passed on Ring. I, I, I think I passed on the company before Ring, Jamie Siminoff's. Uh, Doorbot. Just, Doorbot, yeah. Uh, the par- product was kind of kludgy, but he figured it out. And I yeah, own but, the pro and the regular one now. Yeah. And I should have bet on James. The two, pro- I love, I have Ring on my gate. I have yeah. Ring on my front door. I am obsessed. It's I love my Ring. single favorite product, new product as a consumer. Now I'm biased because we're the seed investor, a investor, and we've invested in subsequent rounds. And I love Jamie Siminoff as an entrepreneur. I think he's one of the true greats. Um, but I love it as a product. Well, he never had a real big win before this either. He was kind of like this journeyman. Travis never had a big win until Uber. That's true. Yeah. It's like these journeyman investors. You're looking for capabilities. So can yeah. I come full circle yeah, to your question sure. before? I'm looking for entrepreneurs that want to go long, that they're obsessed with building whatever they're building for the long term. I'll give you an example. Ethan Anderson at my time. I think yes. you're an investor there. I am. And I was, I uh, so. they, uh, Red Beacon launched at uh, my conference, obviously. And yes. I'm in my time as well. And so. Serial entrepreneur. And Red and, Beacon was a solid win. 50 million from. Uh, my time's going to be bigger. It was sure. north of 90 million. Uh-huh. From Home Depot. I don't yeah. know if we're allowed to announce the exact price. But Whatever. I you know, it happens as time heals all wounds. Guarantee you it's more than 50. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the thing about yeah. my time is we started, we got a lot of early traction. It was doing well. We had a strategic bet to make. I won't say it, but let's say we could choose door X or door Y. Yeah. We chose X and we should have chosen Y. So it took a little bit longer for the company to develop. Did you know before the founder? Maybe. I hope Ethan would say this if he listens to this. Yeah. I was telling him door Y, someone else, and I won't name him, was saying door X. Right. He chose door X. My job is to spar, yeah. but I got to let founders make their own choices. Sure. And sometimes they're right. Sometimes so you have a I'm nice right. heated debate, matter. but they got to ultimately be the captain. And and that's what I believe. And so yeah. I said to him, I don't agree, but you believe it. That's all that matters. Let's go for it. So it didn't quite work. And we ended up back at door Y and door Y has started to work tremendously oh, well. Yum, yum. Now, along the way, he had chances to sell. Mm. And he could have made a lot of money for himself and not a lot of money for me. Right. And, but he didn't want to. He said, I right. didn't join this for a quick win. I joined this because I believe in what I'm building can be transformative. And we're just now starting to see this. Great. And it's early and I'm not promising anything, but I want to say we're 
five or six years in, Jason, yeah. like a lot of entrepreneurs, they're just like, okay, I'm out onto the next one. And Ethan's yeah. not like that. He's so driven for this business. Send me 10 more entrepreneurs like Ethan. I would yeah. back anything Ethan does. I just like the folks who, you know, in addition to being indefatigable, don't give up. Don't give up. I see a lot of cats now who they hit the first or second roadblock and they're just like, yeah, kind of, I could go out and raise more money and I could cut staff, but I kind of don't want to. And I'm just like, what the frack are we talking about here? You took money, but they just you started think it the would mission be, and you're giving up now. You're they just think it would 14. be easier to start brand new with a new cap table. But here's, oh, here's I hate that. But here's what happens, Jason. Is I'm going to never say guy, die. Guy. They're not, they, it wasn't a mission for them. Right. Like with Ethan, when he started my time, he had the mission to yeah. solve that problem. Yeah, un unfinished business. You know, he wanted to keep going on that theme. Yeah. Sam with make space one that we've talked for about sure, before. Yeah. Like he's so driven to yeah. solve that problem. And there were so many doubters for so long. There's no doubters anymore. I mean, like the, yeah. the economics are so good and, but he's so driven to solve that problem. He just won't give up. Yeah. I invested in the other company, Boxby, that tried to do it, and they haven't been able to make it happen, you know. And I'm not sure why. Yeah. I, I don't follow it. I don't follow really competition. It is interesting when you think about competition. But I think they pulled I, out of the part of the market that we're in. Yeah, they did. Um, I think that's very public. So it is interesting when you think about it. We all think that these companies are in competition with each other. But in reality they're really in competition with themselves at these early stages. They have to like their ability to stay focused and delight consumers and build the team. These are all things that are within their control. This is uh, where operating experience matters. This is where coaching from a VC matters. Don't think along the way that the team over at Makespace didn't call me every time we saw an announcement from a competitor. Yeah. And I kept pointing out the industry does $30 billion a year in sales. The number one player in our sector does 2.7 billion of the 30. You know, we're sub yeah. 100 million in revenue, right? Nobody is leading and there's people who've been doing it for decades. Focus on the market. Yeah. Focus on the customer. Competition just doesn't matter at this point. Who's going to win? Uber or Tesla? This is a big conversation everybody has. I've been a shareholder in both companies. I'm still a shareholder in one. I'm dear friends with both. I would say I'm very, very close friends with both founders. So I hate to talk about it, but I love to hear other people talk about it. who's going to win. You know, um, Tesla or Uber, and why? I know you must you, have thought about this. I know you will likely disagree with me on Go this, ahead. but yeah. I, I don't. I think they'll both win. I think they're both, both no. going to be winners. You'll I don't be surprised think, to know that yeah. that is my actual thesis: is that both win. There'll be more than one player. I don't think there's just one market. I don't think they're no. going to develop into some uniform zombie in the future that looks exactly like each other. Yeah. These are really big markets, transportation markets, Huge. and you would never just have one winner. And I think they're both the best in the category of what they do. Yeah. Should we talk about how I missed Uber? You don't want to rub it in. I don't, I don't think it was clear that it would be a winning company uh, in the first iteration when you didn't invest. That Open Angel Forum, just to give set the context, we had about 20 people at that Open Angel Forum in San Francisco. But I have to rewind even further. Yeah. So Ryan Graves, back to blog, was yeah. a reader of my blog. Yeah. And he had been writing comments the on my blog. The original CEO. Um, and he told me... I'm going to be out in the Bay Area. I'd like I to saw meet the you. Yeah. And I'd like to come talk to you. And then he said, uh, well, I can't make it, but could you talk to one of my colleagues sure. while they're out there? And I liked him. You know, he's a smart and thoughtful guy. Sure. We had a lot in common. He was from San Diego. I went to undergrad at UC San Diego. He was living in Chicago. I went to University of Chicago for my MBA. So we had like some connection points. And, you know, <clears throat> the thing about blog is I engage in the comments. So you get to know yeah, people who for engage. Sure. Um, and so then you graciously, uh, invited me to the open angel forum. I went, I saw them speak. I don't know if you'll remember this, Jason, but I mean, back then it was 2009, I think before 2008 or two. I think it was Oh nine. Was think, it? Yeah. I think maybe it was, it was I could be wrong, but I think Oh yeah. nine. And back then there just wasn't that many people. There wasn't a lot of investments happening and they were at small prices. And you always took your time because there just yeah. wasn't a lot of competition. So we're there and Travis is presenting. And in the middle, of, I thought it's a good idea, but they're going to get crushed by organized taxi, you know, unions and whatever. You were right. 
I, I just, well, I'll tell you what I was wrong about in a second, but Chris Freilich from First Round Capital raised his hand yep. on the spot and said, I'm in for 500K. Yep. And I thought, what the F? I've never seen anyone do that. Yeah. Like at a presentation. I like had this. I had held up that I was in. Yeah. And it, it started the. Uh, I think every yeah. angel investor in Uber was in that room. Chris Saka was in that room. Or in Cyan Bannister. Was in that but room. to Chris Saka's credit, he had known him already. Yeah. So Cyan Bannister in first round found out about it through me. Chris had already known him. He had Travis hanging out with him in his hot tub long before, you know, Chris and I were ever friends. But I just, you know, what a ast astonishing success. But here's what I learned from Uber and from Airbnb. Two passes. No, I didn't pass on Airbnb. Okay. I didn't. I didn't actually get. What did you learn? No, but, um, so there's stuff I learned about me. But there, what I want to talk about is why they succeeded when I thought they wouldn't. What about the you stuff? I like the you stuff better. I will go to the you stuff. But they grew so quickly, and it had such immediate initial traction. And I think city governments and regulators and lobbies didn't understand how fast it was growing. And Travis was so good at being public and getting his customers to lobby on his behalf. And I just think it became so big and so popular so fast that if you were a city official and you wanted to be against it, you were gonna be hated. When they, I had this incredible moment where I saw that de Blasio in New York, mm -hmm. who's, I don't, well, I don't want to get into it, but anyway. They had the Bill de Blasio tab and they tried to get people to lobby yeah. you. Yeah, and they lobbied him and they put it on the New York Times and they basically put it in the app like de Blasio wants to kill Jason, Uber we, and he folded so quickly. Rewind two years before that. Yeah. Washington, D.C. tried to outlaw mm. it. Travis flew to D.C. He held a press conference. He had the press come. Yeah. And I'm like, what kind of CEO goes and exposes the fact that he's being shut down? Somebody on a mission. The more that he did that, the more people, he got press and people wanted I can't to tell you how many people who were about. like, I can't tell you how many people said to me, will you talk to Travis? Mm -hmm. Can you talk to Travis? Like almost like, Jason, tell him to you're shut crazy. Up. Tell him to, yeah. And he's to the left of you. Like we know you're crazy, Jason. Yeah. <laughs> so can crazy talk to the even crazier guy in the room and try to dial him back? And I was like, yeah, let me go handle that. I was like, keep doing what you're doing. He mobilized uh, passionate users like me to talk publicly about how important yeah. Uber was. Yeah, well, you talked earlier about exposing things. And, and and I think just the city officials, I think the I think you're, lobby you're right. interest would have crushed them if they didn't grow as quickly as they did. So the lesson I learned, there was no way I could have let it because they were raising like a million and a half and first round was in for 500K. I wasn't Sock in the was driver's some, seat. Yeah. Maybe I could have put in 100, 150. Life changing. And we had a rule that we didn't do deals that we didn't lead. We don't have that rule anymore. Yeah. You know, you learned. Yeah. What was the personal thing? You, you personally thought your ability, I'm guessing here, your, you had figured something out that maybe they wouldn't be able to, or your own personal bias, like maybe I couldn't solve this, therefore they can't. What was the personal baggage you think? that you start to learn as an investor. No. With that, I, with that deal I, or other one, you said there's I, something personal about no, yourself. No, but the personal side, it was more like personal as a fund. We had rules in the fund uh, about the kind of deals that we would do or didn't do. I was maybe biased by my experience of living in London where the taxi lobby is so strong. I just it. thought it could never exist. Having lived in LA and there's no taxi market here and thinking it couldn't work. That said, I was a very passionate user of the product. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have such a bias towards betting on great founders, even if I don't really totally understand where the business is going to go. And it was so clear that they were onto something. Yep. I should have just gone That's what it. I've learned because I passed on Zynga and Twitter. Right. And those are two very close friends of mine, Mark and Evan. And when they both showed it to me, I was like, nah, I don't think poker can work online with virtual currency. And I was like, yeah, Twitter is like a blog without the blog post. It's kind of dumb. But I love both the products. And I, yeah, I love both of you guys. And I passed and I tried to get Sequoia to invest and they passed based on valuation primarily. And that's that was actually how I wound up becoming the scout and the scout program came in because they saw me pushing hard to get Twitter and Zynga in the Sequoia portfolio and it came down to Fred Wilson versus Sequoia. And Sequoia passed, I think, on both because of valuation. And then I think they... It's well, hard like, for me to feel sorry for Sequoia. They've done well, just they, fine. <laughs> I, I can tell you how close they were. I think yeah. they would have beaten Fred in both those deals. Really? I actually think historically, if they had gone full bore, they would have easily gotten both deals. Not easily. They would have 
had the edge. It would have been a 60, 40, I would say 60 to 70% edge to Sequoia. They would have gotten at least one of them and had a just one in three chance of getting both. But you know, it's, you can't bat a thousand, but it's, it really is interesting, I think. And I think this has been like a great discussion heart to heart of what you and I have both learned in this last decade mm -hmm. about investing, which is like, it all comes down to the founder, doesn't it? The most talented founders who are driven by purpose, who want to stay till the end of the company, mission-driven, maniacal founders, that's what matters. And they're not always easy to get along with. That's the other thing I've learned. It's like, if you're looking for somebody who's going to change the world, they're going to, you know, people evolve, right? Mm -hmm. You and I are not the same people we were when we met. People evolve, number one. Number two, you know, this is not the business of like being gracious all the time or not having sharp elbows. If you look at what Zuckerberg's done or Elon's done or Bezos, like it, it doesn't, it requires sometimes a level of focus and things get knocked over and people's feelings get hurt, but it's always in the purpose of some higher so mission. This is something we discuss internally a lot, Jason. Like, so for the newer partners who have been here five years or less, from time to time, it's easy to get put off by arrogance. Yeah. And I like to say to my partners, if you look at the most successful people in our industry, the overwhelming majority of them are a little bit arrogant. If you look yeah. at anywhere from Bill Gates, Larry Ellison, Tom Siebel, Mark Benioff, Mark Pincus, yeah. Mark Zuckerberg, Evan Spiegel, like these aren't like wallflowers, right? Yeah. And, and our, one person's arrogance is another person's conviction, I think is how I would say it. I think that might be the way I would say it. You know, if you, if you know, when I talk to Elon and I just, he's, he's got such conviction and purpose. Self-assured. Yeah. It, 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 some people could just be like, oh, that guy's arrogant or Travis. It's just like, it's not arrogant. It's just sometimes people can see around the corner and they see a future that's just so obvious and you're just further behind on the planet earth and they see the sunrise, you know, an hour before you, they know the sun's coming. They see it. They know where it is. They can point to it. You can't see it. It's completely dark. But when the earth rotates, you're, you're going to see it just like them. And now everybody thinks, oh, Uber's so obvious. When Uber happened, I had 17 people say no. And one person, you know, this, this is the crazy part. It'll be in my book. One person said, if you can convince Travis to make this an enterprise software company where he sells to the cab companies, I'm in. Right. And I was like, let me go, let me go see. And yeah. I went, and you know what I did? What? Nothing. Okay. I was like, I will never put that stupid fucking idea in Travis's head. Yeah. And I told him years later, like, by the way, that guy said this. Mm -hmm. But I, I, at the time, I was like, I don't want to pollute his head because yeah. the entire magic of the product was n getting rid of the cab company. Yep. And they said they didn't want to be in the dirty business. Right. And I was like, oh, I'm a little racist. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, he's like, I don't want to be in dirty. I think it was the way he said, dirty business with those people. Yeah. It was a kind of racist. Yeah. Anyway, listen, Mark, uh, you know, it's been great to get to know you over these years and it's great to be on a board with you finally brought on the density it. it's board great. it's great and to see you up close and personal working on stuff i was just watching your emails it was great to be on the board with somebody i have to say like where the email came in and i was out of the office and then i see your response and i'm reading the response um to andrew from density and i said i could only reply and say what he said because yeah. it's exactly what i would have done and i was like wow that's just really great to know there's somebody else watching the store and being able to coach and like i'm not there but hey you know uh and i just have great great um and i, and I think honestly great boards like um the reason i like having great board members is it's good for me to have a sparring partner. It's like, yeah. I want to say ideas, but then have you push back and say, well, I'm not sure I see, yeah. you know, Rory O'Driscoll and I are on a board. He's at Scale Ventures. And <clears throat> so often we look at a problem the same way, but there's like the 15 to 20% where we really disagree. Yeah. And I know when he's going to disagree with me. I talked to him just before this interview, call him up and it's refreshing to have someone push back from a different place and yeah. have different experience. And I think the entrepreneur gains from that. Yeah, for sure. All right, listen, uh, if you don't uh, read both sides of the table, where the hell have you been? Get on that. And if you don't know about Snapstorms, get on that. And if you want to follow Mark Suster on the Snapchat where he's doing some of his best work, uh, M. Suster, S-U-S-T-E-R. The firm, of course, is up front. Yep. Um, up front as in we're up front with you or up front as we're in front of the pack? What is it? It's funny you ask that. So our brand values are 
Uh, we are transparent. Okay. So it's WYSIWYG. We're upfront with you. You get a real opinion from us. We don't like pretend. And we're early stage. We wanted to say up we front. invest Got up it. Front. So it's a dual, yep. dual meaning. I'm going to... Um, a rename double launch. Entendre. It's a double entendre there. I'm going to rename uh, launch fund uh, candid bastard. Blunt asshole. <laughs> Ventures. Sorry. Uh, all right. Listen, this has been an amazing episode and uh, great to have you on the program again. It's been so long. Yeah. Been let's, not, let's not let it go so long. Well, you time. know what? I'm, I'm starting to now, like when I have a good conversation with people and I have this producer, Jackie, who's been with me, he's been with me for a while now and she's in it for the long term. She's so good. I basically come out of the conversations and when it's really good, I say, Put it on the calendar for 12, 18, or six months. So mm-hmm. I'd be like, get that guy. Oh, no, now people are going to, I shouldn't have said that on air. We may have to cut this part out. I'll leave it in. But anyway, I basically say, like, if right. that was really good, just rebook that person. Rebook now for a year from now. Just let, like, fill, we have 100 spots a year. That person earned another spot. Yeah. And like, let's just, and I don't know if I've ever done it. Six months sometimes for the news roundtable, but that'd be good to have you on the news roundtable sometime to talk about the news. Anytime. What's your, if you could put all of your net worth into only one public company? Into only one. I'll make it two. I'll make it two. Company. Two public companies. You have to put all your net worth into just two. <sighs> Makes it hard. I'll make it three. Three companies. You got to pick three. I'm not a good public stock investor, but okay, I'll tell but you, you the place that I'm longest in, and I always have been longest, and I think it's the best, the most strategic person in our industry is Amazon. Okay, so that's your number one. Mm-hmm. Who's your other two? I don't know. Honestly, I don't look at public stocks. It's hard yeah. to bet against Google and Google's for future. But my problem with Google is just when you become such a big company and it's yeah. valued so highly, like... Where does it go from here? Yeah. So I guess I struggle with both. The, those are, for me, the two of the best run companies Disney, out Tesla, there. Apple. And I, I'm sorry. Disney, Tesla, Amazon are my three. Those are the three I like. You know why? why? Tesla's my, like, this could go 10x, um, mm-hmm. you know, from here. Disney is mine downside protection star wars you know toy story mm, they have the franchise Marvel, they yeah. got all that stuff it's not going anywhere mm-hmm. it's impossible uh, and then amazon is just like what business is he not capable of becoming a player in smartphones okay i think if he tries two more times he will be a player sure like <laughs> but how is he a player in so many things and i think he's got so many areas where he's going to dominate in the future that i think their potential is limitless it is. All right, listen, Mark Suster, thanks for coming back on the program. Thanks and for we'll having see you me. all next time. Bye bye.